So we finished talking about Purim, and now we're going to talk about the curious connection between Pesach and Purim. Purim and Pesach. So we've just got Purim is barely in our rearview mirror. I mean, it's like really just a, a week and a half ago, and um, and now we've got Pesach coming up. And we have to understand, is there some sort of connection? Now, obviously, if you look at the Jewish calendar, there are very few Jewish holidays that are so closely connected, exactly one month apart, right? Um, as a matter of fact, well, you have the high holidays, which are Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot, all within a very short period, and they are very closely connected. And here we see uh, Purim and Pesach being closely connected, and we have to wonder, is, is there a connection? All sources seem to indicate that there is a connection. The Talmud has a very interesting question. In the Jewish calendar year, we have a leap year. Right? So a leap year is not an extra day like it here is in America, February 29th. In Jewish calendars, a leap year is an extra month, right? Because we follow the lunar calendar. The lunar calendar is 354 days. They follow the solar calendar, which is 365 days, which means we are off by 11 days a year, which means that Every three years, we're 33 days off, and if you think about it, a lunar month is 29 and a half days. We're more than a full month off every three years. So the Jewish system, we have a new, a leap year with an extra month seven times every 19 years. Okay? That's the exact calculation, because it's a little bit more than, it's a little bit less than, than um, every three years. And it's a full month. So now you have, what do you do? How do you add an extra month? You have Adar 1 and Adar 2. So the Talmud asked the following question. If we have two Adars, when should we celebrate Purim? Should we celebrate Purim in the first Adar or in the second Adar? Now, being that Purim is definitely a holiday favorite for most people, there's beautiful costumes and, and, and drinking and eating and charity, we should really just do both. That would probably be the best situation, but that's not what it is. So the Talmud discusses what should we do. The first opinion in the Talmud is that we should have Purim in the first Adar. You don't want to bypass an opportunity for a mitzvah. You know, I don't know if you know this, but the ideal time, when's the ideal time for a bris? Day 8. Well, day 8, of course, right? That is 100% correct, day 8. But when on day 8 should you have a bris? Ideally, you're supposed to have it in the morning. Yeah. Why? Because when finally the baby's ready for his bris, I don't want to wait. I don't want to bypass that first opportunity. We have a concept... Ein ma'avirin al mitzvahs. We don't pass by a mitzvah. So the first opportunity you have to be able to do the bris, you want to do it. So ideally, again, today a lot of times people do brises at five o'clock in the afternoon because they can get a better crowd or whatever it is. But the real time a bris is supposed to be is in the morning because as soon as you have the ability to do this amazing, amazing mitzvah, once in a lifetime opportunity, you want to do it right away. When is the best time, for example, for davening services in the morning? You know, early. Sunrise. Early. Sunrise. Exactly right. Sunrise. The ideal is that a person should start praying their silent devotion at exactly sunrise. And in every city, and many, in Israel, for example, my parents live in Jerusalem, there are literally every single day at the exact crack of dawn. So if, if, if the sun rises over the, over the horizon at 632 and 48 seconds, at 6.32 and 48 seconds, in Jerusalem alone, there are probably thousands for sure, could be as many as 10,000 people who are starting their prayer exactly on time. And the way they calculate is they calculate how much time before sunrise do they need to start praying so they can get up to the prayer, the silent devotion, exactly at sunrise, because there, there are prayers before the silent devotion, right? There's the blessings, and then there's the, there's the Pesuket de Zimra, and then there's the Shema, and all that. So you need about 25 minutes, 23 minutes, depending how fast the, the, the services are. So if, if sunrise is 648, they'll start services that day at, uh, let's say, at, at 23 minutes early. They'll start services at, uh, what is it? Yeah, 625. And then the next day, if sunrise is at 647, they'll start at, at 619. They literally, every day, the time of services changes. As and, and the chazans in these minions, by the way, the people who are leading the services, these are pros. These are pros because they have an atomic clock, right, which has the exact time, okay? They have an atomic clock in front of them, and somehow, miraculously, they're able to, like, calibrate the speed of their services that they literally, you know, you, you go into the service, Baruch HaTashem Ga'al Yisrael, and if it's quiet, that's when the sign devotion starts. And they are able to calibrate their services that if it starts, if sunrise, the sun peaks over the horizon at 
48 and 32 seconds. They will literally get Baruch HaTashem, Ga'al Yisrael, 648 and 32 seconds. It's amazing. It is absolutely amazing to watch. And here in, in, in Detroit, we have a minion like that. And in every major city, there's a minion like that. And in Jerusalem or bigger cities with large Jewish populations, you have thousands of people who, what's the idea? The idea is, it shows I'm so excited to, to, to talk to God. What's the sound of devotion? Sound of devotion is me and God having a one-on-one -on -one conversation. I'm so excited to do that. I get to talk to God. I want to do it as soon as I can. I don't want to, I'm not, I'll wake up, I'll get, yeah, whatever. I'll have a couple coffees, I'll read the paper, and then maybe I'll head on over to the services. Oh, no, 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 no. They want to do it right away. <laughs> You can start in bed with Modena Milifanecha. Yeah. You can. That's 100% right. And that's a good thing, too. So if you want to do that, I, do that. I will salute you, right? <laughs> if you want to say 648, 32 seconds, the sunrise here in Detroit, at 648 and 32 seconds, I will start my Modena Ni. I will seriously, I will lift my yarmulke to you, right? <laughs> but then there are people who are even more, like, there's a higher level of dedication. No offense. Like, there's people who are saying, I'm going to get up out of bed, get dressed in my clothing, and get ready, and go to service and start and do all the prelude services and get up. That's, that's, a, that's a very high level. My grandfather, uh, he should live and be well. He's right now in his 90s for, for decades. After he retired, he did that. He was there every single morning starting at exactly sunrise. Now, by the way, my grandfather, he should live and be well at 180. He should, why not, right? Um, my grandfather, for, he would get up. He would be in, in, in synagogue. An hour and a half before those, he would like get to, to synagogue at like 3 o'clock in the morning, and he would like say the entire book of Psalms every morning, and he would put out the mat for the Kohanim to stand on, and he would make sure to put the pushka on the, on the uh, bima, and he would make sure everything, he would like set up the whole synagogue, he had a whole routine every morning, that's it was a remarkable thing. Yeah, sure. that, that's what your dad did, that's what, that was my dad. There you go, and it's an amazing thing, it's an amazing thing, I have such... Envy of my grandfather's reward for that, you know, like you're allowed to have envy, by the way, of good things, right? I have an envy for my grandfather's reward for that incredible mitzvah, and I, I hope that I'll be able to do that one day. In any case, so the first opinion in the Talmud is that you have two others, other one and other two. When should you make Purim? Make an other one, right? Why bypass an opportunity for a mitzvah? Make Purim on the 15th and 14th day of other one. The second opinion says no. We have to do Purim in Adar 2, in the second Adar. Why? And I already made a blessing, so I'm sorry I couldn't okay. furnish okay. you guys. Yeah, there you go. You were worried there for a moment. <laughs> so, Rabbi, stop making blessings? No. Rabbi loves to make blessings. But um, I made one already. Um, so the Talmud, the second opinion of the Talmud is that we should put a Purim in the second Adar. Why? Mismach geula le geula adifa, which means it is better to connect the redemption of Purim to the redemption of Pesach. So if we put Purim in Adar 2, they'll be exactly a month apart. If we put Purim in Adar 1, they'll be two months apart. And we want to bring closer the redemption of Purim to the redemption of Pesach, indicating there's a strong sort of connection between the two. Now, another example. There's a phrase in the Talmud. This is a, uh, this is a, a staff favorite. Um, there's a phrase in the Talmud. It says, Mi nechnas adar marbim besimcha. Which means, at, when Adar comes in, the month of Adar, we're supposed to increase in our joy. So Adar is a joyous month. Av, for example, or Tisha B'Av is, the Talmud says the opposite. Misha nichnas av, mimma'atin b'simcha. When av comes in, we lessen our joy. Now listen, listen to the language carefully, by the way. Here's a beautiful idea. Again, it says when adar comes in, we increase our joy. When av comes in, we decrease our joy. But the default is always to be joyous. As a Jew, we're always supposed to be happy. Sometimes we're a little extra happy, and sometimes a little bit less happy, but always happy. Always happy. As the verse says, Ivdu es Hashem b'simcha. Serve God with joy. God doesn't want you walking around with Judaism as if it's like a burden on your back, right? That's not what Ju Judaism is not meant to be a burden on your back. If you're doing Judaism and it's a burden, you are doing Judaism wrong. If you're teaching Judaism to your kids and it's a burden, you're teaching it to your kids wrong, right? There's a famous... One second. Um, Mrs. Paz. 
Is there a class next week as well? There is. Yeah, there is. Oh. Okay, okay. No, I just got to calibrate. I got to calibrate. So, okay. We, I can afford this detour. I can afford this detour now that I know we got, I got one more week with you guys in this month. We, we're lucky. March, we have five Wednesdays together. Beautiful. That's what I like about March. March madness. All right. So, here we go. So, there is a, um, there's a story. This is, I think, a very important story, and I think it tells us a lot about what's going on in American Jewry today. There is a story about a man who, this is, you know, back in the 1800s, when a lot of European countries were going out and exploring and annexing different parts of Africa, right? They, I mean, they literally carved pretty much the, the entire continent of Africa. So there's a, a guy, we'll call him Bob, and Bob lived in, in a, he was a wealthy guy, lived up in a big house on the top of the hill in some town in, uh, in England, call it Devonshire, or Lancashire, or Yorkshire, or whatever it was, you know what I'm saying? One of the shirts. Exactly, he lived in a shirt. He sure lived there. And he was one of the wealthier guys, and he lived in a house on top of the, of the, on top of the hill, and it was a house, uh, uh, a, um, uh, it was near the port, and at one point, someone came to him with an investment, and he had found this, this diamond mine in Congo, and he was going to buy the rights, and he was going to mine, and they were going to find, like, you know, just really, there's supposed to be an incredible amount of diamonds there, and uh, he wants this guy, this wealthy guy, to invest with him. And he showed the guy the maps, and the territories, and the cartography, and the, the whole thing, and it, it looks like an incredible business opportunity. An incredible business opportunity. So... <laughs> The wealthy guy says, all right, I'll invest. And he invests a really significant chunk of money, half of his retirement savings, let's say, because this is supposed to be the diamond mine. You know what I'm saying? And the guy says, look, I'm going to be gone. I got the schedule of the steamships. I'm going to take this steamship, like this week, I'm leaving town. I'm going to go there. I'm going to be there for roughly six months. <clears throat> and then I'm going to come back on this and this date, because again, they had, they had all the scheduled dates for the steamships for the next year. Okay, guy goes, six months go by, he doesn't come back. You know, now the steamship comes every week. Every week the steamship comes. Six months go by, they don't hear from him. The next week they don't hear from him. The next week they don't hear from him. And the father is really concerned. We're talking about it's half of his retirement, it's a significant you know, percentage of the family wealth, and, and, and he's really, really concerned because he's also leveraged his other properties, whatever it was. I mean, this is really, if this goes bust, this guy doesn't show up. And there's a lot of dangers in those days. There are pirates and robbers and bandits, and it was a wild, wild west out there. So he's really concerned. And then he gets a, a, a telegram and says, don't worry, I'm alive. We've been successful. Wait for me. On Wednesday afternoons at 12:30, I'm coming on one of the next ships. The next Wednesday afternoon comes by, and he's sitting there on his house on top of the hill, looking down at the harbor. And the steamship pulls in. He's waiting. Is someone coming up? Someone? No one's there. The next Wednesday, he's waiting. No one's there. The whole family is starting to get all you know freaked out. It's a scary situation. So the following Wednesday, he's standing at the window and he's pacing back and forth, and his young daughter who's eight years old, is sitting there. She knows that daddy's stressed out and, and daddy's waiting for this person to come back and hopefully bring them diamonds and everything. And they're waiting and they're waiting and they watch and they see this guy heading up the hill towards them. And this guy's schlepping his big bag. And the girl says, look, daddy, that's him. He's coming up. It's 1230 on a Wednesday. That's got to be him. And the father says, no, 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 that's not him. No, no, Daddy, I think it's him, I think it's him. No, it's not him. Father goes, how do you know it's not him, Daddy? How do you know it's not him? And the father says, look at that man. He's got this big burden on his back, and he's schlepping it up the hill with a sad face. When you're carrying diamonds, you're not schlepping anything up the hill with a sad face. You're springing up the hill with joy in your eyes. Right? If that was that man coming to deliver me my share of the diamonds, you know, He'd be springing up the road with this bag of diamonds, smiles on his face. You see the guy schlepping like this? That guy's not carrying diamonds. That guy's carrying potatoes or coal or whatever it is. He's not carrying diamonds. The same thing goes for Torah. 
We're not gonna find that. <laughs> yes, you're not gonna find out. The same thing goes for Torah. If you are schlepping your way up the road, and it's a burden, and you're carrying it. Oh yeah, I gotta do this. Oh yeah, we gotta do Pesach now. Oh yeah, we gotta clean. Oh yeah, we gotta this and Rosh Hashanah. We gotta have guests over. Oh yeah, I'm gonna heal. I'm gonna what do I do? If that's your Judaism, oh yeah, I gotta daven. I gotta pray now. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> it's just not gonna carry over. That's not Judaism. You're not doing it right because Judaism is diamonds. And when you're carrying diamonds, you should have a spring in your step, a joy, a twinkle in your eye. So a litmus test. For ourselves to know, are we doing Judaism right? One of those litmus tests is if it's a burden for you, you're probably not doing it right. And guess what? Kids don't want to pick up burdens from their parents. Today in America, according to the Pew Report, 35% of American Jews under the age of 35 say they have no religion. That's an astounding number. And to me, what that represents is a lot of people saying, I'm not carrying this burden anymore. My parents schlepped it along, and my grandparents schlepped it over here from Europe, and my great-grandparents schlepped it over. I'm not carrying this burden anymore. I'm just culturally Jewish. I have no more religion. That religion thing is a burden. So it's really important in how we teach, how we have the simcha, how we have the joy. God says, here's how I want you to serve me. If do as Hashem b'simcha, serve me with joy. That's got to be the baseline for all of your Judaism. Now, during the month of Adar, you ratchet it up a little bit. During the month of Av, you ratchet it down a little bit. But the way you've got to serve me, God says, is serve me with joy. Judaism should be beautiful and a pleasure for you, not a burden. You know, it's, it's interesting. I uh, she wrote about this in the Shabbos email recently. Thank you. There was a particular there was a particular prayer that I was doing. Um, it's a very long prayer. It's done on Mondays and Thursdays, and uh, it's called the Tachnun. So normal Tachnun is shorter, but on Mondays and Thursdays there's a long, lengthy, like just six pages straight of just reading. You know. And I wasn't feeling it. It was feeling, I'm, to be open and honest with you guys, it was feeling like a burden. Gotta read, and 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 gotta read. It felt like a burden to me. And I was very unhappy about that. I don't want my Judaism to be a burden. So what did I do? I decided, here's what I'm gonna, I'm gonna slow that train down. And I'm probably not gonna finish all six pages. Maybe I'll do a page and a half, but I'll read it slowly and enjoy it and focus on the words. And I did that. And you know what? It's a pleasure. I look forward to it. It's an opportunity. That the words are very meaningful words. But it's an opportunity when I'm trying to rush my way through it, then, yeah, it wasn't enjoyable. When I slow it down, you know, chew your food. Don't wolf it down. Chew it. And I'm starting out, I'm, I'm enjoying it. I guess I wasn't doing it right before. That's why it wasn't a pleasure to me. I wasn't doing it right so Judaism, a very important litmus test. If it's becoming a burden, it means, or if it is a burden, we're not doing it right. And if we're not doing it right, there's no way we're going to be able to pass it down to our kids. In any case, so that's the, the idea. Number one is God wants to serve, have us serve him with pleasure, with joy. Now in Adar, the Talmud says, when Adar comes in, we should increase our joy. Now listen <coughs> to what Rashi is the primary commentator on the Talmud. Listen to what he writes. I'm going to read to you straight the text of Rashi. It's right here on my thing. Rashi says, when when um, when uh, Adar, when Adar comes in, we should increase our joy. Why? Yemei Nisim Hayu Israel. There were days of miracles for the Jewish people. Purim Upesach. Purim and Pesach, which is kind of strange, because Pesach is not in Adar. We're talking about increasing our joy in the month of Adar, and you say it's days of miracles, Purim and Pesach, but there were, Pesach is not in Adar. But Rashi is hinting 
there is this very strong connection between Purim and Pesach. What is this connection? It's not a coincidence that the two holidays are one month apart, very close to each other on the calendar, as we saw already that the reason why we celebrate Purim in the second Adar is that there's a need to connect the Geula, the redemption of Purim, to the redemption of Pesach. And when we describe the joy of Adar, it's not just the joy of Purim, it's the joy of Purim and Pesach. So these are very closely connected. But on the other hand, these holidays look very different. Purim, we talked about this in our previous weeks, there's no mention of God in the Megillah, right? Purim is definitely a, a holiday that celebrates God saving us, but it's very, very hidden, right? God's name is nowhere in the Megillah. It's all done through sort of coincidences, right? It so happened that Esther got uh, chosen as the queen, and it so happened that Mordechai overheard the people plotting to kill the king, and it so happened that he understood the language they were speaking because he was on the high court and he had to know all the languages, and it so happened that the day that the king was about to give, allow Haman to kill Mordechai, he read in his books of of his chronicles that he had never rewarded Haman, uh, Mordechai for saving his life, and it so happened that Haman came, and it so happened, it's all these incredible coincidences which end up having the force of a, of a battering ram and just batter into your head, God's watching over us. Even in the darkness, even when it appears like everything is going to, you know, to pot, God is there watching over us the entire time, he was there the entire time, he is there the entire time, that's sort of the celebration of Purim. The celebration of Pesach is the exact opposite. Pesach celebrates the one time in history where God pulled back the curtain and showed himself and his power to the world in unparalleled and unprecedented and never again to be found display of his might. Blood, frogs, lice, all coming up from beneath the ground level, showing God controls everything below the ground. Wild animals, pestilence, boils, all at the ground level, showing that God has control over the ground levels. Locusts. Lice. Hail. No, lice is below ground. The oh. actual ground itself turned to lice. That was the first, right? So we had the blood, which was the rivers, all this is below ground, right? The rivers are already below, you know, ground level. And the, the frogs, which came up from the rivers too, and the lice that was below ground, and you had the wild animals roaming, the, the animals, the, the pestilence, which was their own animals dying, and then the boils, which was at ground level. And then you have the hail, and the locusts coming down from on high, and the pitch black, the darkness, the, those are all things that are in, this, in, the, in, the, in the heavens. So God is showing very clearly, I control every part of this universe below ground, at the ground level, above ground, and of course, Makas Bechoros, the death of the firstborn, God says, I'm controlling life itself. Then there was the open miracle, the splitting of the sea. There was, if Pesach celebrates anything, it celebrates the most clear time in all of recorded history that God showed himself to mankind to save the Jewish people. So Purim and Pesach, in that sense, they're both times of salvation, but they couldn't be further apart. Purim, the salvation, is all like sort of secret. God's name is nowhere on the whole thing. There was no God going to Ahasuerus and saying, my firstborn son is Israel, you better leave him alone. You better let him go. No, that happened in Pesach. Purim is all secrets, all coincidences being orchestrated by God. But his name is not, his stamp is not on the Megillah. It's not even found in the Megillah. Pesach is the exact opposite. So what is the connection? Hold on a second. Okay. The connection is, give me one second, I just have a plumber coming out. <laughs> he doesn't have my address. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I, I've never done this before, by the way, but just... Okay, well, I'll take a break. <laughs> Everyone else check your phones. Maybe your plumber's coming out and doesn't know where your address is. And if you don't have him come, then you're going to have not a happy situation in the home front. Okay. Okay, now, so here's the idea. I'm going to tell you sort of a story, 
and it'll illustrate for us a little bit about what the difference between Purim and Pesach is. Well, sorry, the connection. There once was a czar. And the mighty, mighty czar ruled over the entire Russia. A massive, massive country spanning from the Baltic all the way to the Pacific, right? Massive country. And the czar had a son, the crown prince, the first in line, the one who one day would take the father's crown and put it on his own head. But unfortunately, the czar's son just somehow did not have the patience that he needed. He knew that eventually he'd become the, the, the czar, but he didn't want to wait that long. And by the time he was 18 years old, he was already hankering to remove his father and seize control of the throne. And the way he did that was he tried to talk to the different generals and be like, hey, General Petrikov, you know, why don't you and I, you take your men, your best, best soldiers, you storm the palace, you overthrow the palace guards, you kill my father, I become the new czar, and I'll make you the deputy in charge of the entire country, or whatever it is, whatever you want. But the generals were loyal to, their fa to his father. And they were, instead of helping him, they reported it to his father. First time you can imagine the father heard of this, he was furious, furious. You're going to try to make a coup in my palace to overthrow me? Get me out of the picture? Throw me in prison or kill me? Whatever it is? And you're my son? He yelled and screamed and, and the kid was like, oh, I'm so, so far. I'm so sorry, Dad. I'm never, ever, 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 ever going to do it again. Three years later, the kid's 21 years old. <laughs> Same thing. So I was plotting to overthrow the father. And this time the father is so furious, he throws him in prison for two months, has him fed moldy bread. And the kid's crying to his father, please, I'm so sorry. All right, I'm giving you one last chance. But you, you blow this one and you're done. Sure enough, a year later, 22-year-old, he's talking to the general. Hey, general, let's go make a coup. We'll throw my father in prison. I'll take over. You'll become the new deputy. Some of them are. Yeah, is, right? <laughs> what, 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 is, what did Einstein say? Einstein said, what's the definition of insanity? Try to do the same thing and different, get different results. But he does speak different generals, so maybe. Maybe. Anyway, the third time the father says, that's it, kiddo. You're done. If you were anybody but my son, I would have had you killed the first time. And I still, I can't. I can't kill you. You're my son. I can't do it. But what I'm going to do, I am going to banish you to as far away from the castle as possible. I'm going to banish you to the Gula. most forbidden, exactly, <laughs> the most forbidden countryside in Siberia. Go live there. Go live there. You want, to, you want to overthrow me? Let's see what this gets you. And he takes his kid, sends him packing on a train, going east, all the way to the farthest reaches of Siberia. And the kid gets there, and it's a miserable life. I mean, he's sitting here, all these peasants, they're ignorant, they don't know anything, right? He grew up in a palace reading and going to the opera, and they're sitting here, these peasants, they can't read, they can't write, they're, it's freezing cold over there. These people make a meager, meager living, you know, pulling potatoes out of the earth. You know, and it's like the houses are all crumbling and falling, and it's freezing cold in the winter, and there's tons of mosquitoes in the summer, and life is miserable. And he's in Siberia for like two years, and he's 24 years old. And guess what he does? In Siberia, he starts talking to the local peasants. He's like, guys, listen up. I'm the, I'm the crown prince. And we can start a revolution right here. Right here, we can start a revolution. We can get my dad out of the picture. We'll sweep across the whole country from the east to the west. We'll just get stronger and stronger as we go. The peasants, we will rebel. We will show those rich people in the capitals who really matters. And he's talking. And the peasants, <coughs> even the peasants, are loyal to his father. And every time he brings it up, they say, Shut up, be quiet, stop it, stop talking this trash. And one day they're all sitting in the, in the bar over there, you know, having their drinks and drinking their vodka, their potato vodka. And of course, he can't keep his mouth shut. And then finally, the peasants have had it with him. They say, you know what, kiddo? 
we're going to beat you to death right now. And they pull him out because enough, we're afraid for our own lives. You know, you keep talking all this revolution. And in the middle of the night, it's like 10 o'clock, it's dark outside, they pull the crown prince out to the middle of the square and they start beating him. There's just like 10 men standing around him, kicking him, punching him. And he realizes this is game up. So in his desperation, he screams out, in honor of my father, the king, save me! I'm the crown prince, not in honor of me! In honor of, the cr in honor of my father, save me, save me, save me! And suddenly, out of nowhere, these men start showing up in the forest. They were, And they rush in and they pry all the peasants off and they save the kid. Turned out that unbeknownst to the child, the father not only sent him to Siberia, he sent a whole contingent, a whole troop of his guards to watch over his son. Even while his son was in Siberia, he was being watched the whole time by his father's guards. And the minute he was in real trouble and he screamed out, save me in honor of my father, boom! They were right there and they saved him. And they haul the kid back to his house and they throw him in there. And the kid starts thinking, He's like, what an idiot I am. Like he finally hits home. As he's sitting there in his house, bruised up, banged up, he's like, my father, he gave me everything. Everything. And what did I do? I rebelled, and I rebelled, and I rebelled, and he didn't kill me, which is the normal punishment for treason. He didn't kill me the first time. He didn't kill me the second time. He didn't kill me the third time. And finally, he sent me out here, which is what I needed. Because when I was in the palace, I was totally being terrible. And he sent me out here, and I thought he abandoned me, but he didn't abandon me. He had these men watching over me all the time. The minute I called out, they were there. What's wrong with me? I love my father. I want to get back on his good side. And that night, he writes his dad a letter, crying tears, legitimate, saying, Dad, I'm so sorry. I can't believe I put you through this. You're my father. You gave me everything. You took care of me from the time I was a child. And what did I do? I just repaid you with rebelliousness and, and, and horrific plans to try to get you out of the picture. And I just want you to know that all I want right now is, is I want to get back into a relationship with you. I, I, I I'm beyond sorry. No more excuses. No more anything. I just want you. I want to come back home, Daddy. Okay. What does the father say? Sure, come on back. Not so quick. Dad said, listen, son, sends him back a letter. I love you too. I always have. You're the apple of my eye. You're my firstborn son. I love you but I can't have you come back. I'm not going to bring you back to my palace and once again proudly proclaim to everybody you're my son until you clean up your act. I want you to go through your Rolodex. I want you to find all your punk friends who talk to you about rebellion and fed that into your ear. I want you to divest yourself of all those people. I want you to do some real clinical work getting all that rebelliousness out of your heart. And if you can do that, then I'll bring you back to my palace and once again proudly proclaim that you are my son. That, my friends, is the story of Purim and Pesach. As you might have imagined, who's the crown prince? The Jewish people. And who's the king? God. We are God's firstborn child. God straight out says, Beni Bechori Yisrael. My firstborn son is Israel. And here we were living in Israel, in the palace, and God was taking care of us. Everything was great. But what do we do? We started serving idols. What is idol worship? It means I'm trying to get God out of the picture. I don't need God. 
my, my sun god will provide me with this, and my rain god will provide me with that. I don't need God. I'll get him out of the picture. And the prophets came calling, crying, begging for years, for hundreds of years. The prophets came saying, Jews, wake up! Stop worshiping idols in the land of Israel! Stop plotting to overthrow the king in his own palace! And the idols are the generals. The idols, the sun, the moon, the earth, these are God's forces that God put into this world to serve us and to take care of us. It's God's military, so to speak. And we're reaching out to God's generals, bowing down to the, to the sun's and the moons, and the earth, and the water gods. And the prophets are screaming, Jews, stop it! Read the books of Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah especially. The prophets are screaming, please stop this! Elijah the prophet, fighting with the, with the prophets of the Baal. The Baal was the primary idol during that time. Massive showdown. King, it was a King Menashe, I think, and Queenie's Jezebel. And, and the prophets are begging the Jews, stop, please. And we don't. Again and again and again, we try to make coups to overthrow God. And finally God says, you know what? You are out of here. And he warned us. He warned us. The prophet said, if you don't stop this, you're going to be thrown out of the land of Israel. We don't listen. Babylonians come, destroy the temple, and God throws us out of Israel into Babylonia, into the far reaches of Babylonia. <coughs> you would think that while we were in exile in Siberia, so to speak, in Babylonia, we would get, we would get the message, and we would stop serving idols. Mm -mm. Not only that, when Ahasuerus makes a party that is celebrating the downfall of the Jewish people, and the, the sort of the, the weakening of the Jewish God, who's showing up? The Jews. And again, Mordechai told them, don't do this. You're in Siberia already. You're in Siberia already. Don't do this. But what do they do? They keep doing it. And finally, yeah. Could this possibly be used to explain the Holocaust? Possibly. I don't want to get into that right now, but if you look at the book of Deuteronomy, in the book of Deuteronomy, oh, I know, I know. God says straight out, you right. try to walk away from me, right. I will slap you back right. into position. Right. And in Germany before the war, and in, in general in Europe, there were tons of Jews converting to Christianity right. all over the books. Mm -hmm. Especially uh, Germany. It's the yeah. same. That's right. right. The, Jews get, the Jews get fat and they kick. So here we are in Siberia, in Babylonia, and we should have finally learned our lesson, but no. King Ahasuerus is making a party to celebrate the weakening of the Jewish God, and the Jews showing up in droves. Say, How do I look at my suit? Is it good for this party? I'm going to the God weakening party. Do I look good, huh? Honey, How, what do you say? Oh, you look great. They're going to love you over there at that party, at the God weakening party. Crazy. And of course, what ends up happening? The peasants turn on the Jews, and they start pummeling the Jews. They put out proclamations saying Jews all over our entire you know, kingdom are going to die. We're going to kill them all. And as we're out there in the, in, the, in the cold, in the snow, getting beat up on, and there's proclamations all over the kingdom saying everyone can kill the Jews on the 13th day of Adar, finally... We start yelling and screaming. We gather in our synagogues and for a three days straight, we yell out and scream to God, please, please save us. And suddenly out of nowhere, everything's already in place. Mordechai and Esther, boom, 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 boom. And before you know it, Haman's hanging on the, on the tree. And we realize that the whole time, while we were in Siberia, God's men were there, right? The whole time, all of his messengers, everything was in place already. That's the story of Purim. But the story of Pesach is a little different. Because we're saying to God, when it comes to Pesach, we don't want 
to just know that your agents are out there watching over us. We want you to be proud of us once again. We want you to take us back to your palace once again. We want you to show yourself to the world once again. Let the whole world know who you are and who we are. What do you think is going to happen in the time of Messiah to ISIS? What's going to happen in the times of Messiah to the BDS movement? What's going to happen in the times of Messiah to the Ku Klux Klan and the neo-Nazis in Hungary? You know what's going to happen? They're going to be, A, filled with shame, utter, utter, total shame, because in the time of Messiah, the world will be filled with knowledge of God like the waters cover the sea. Right? There will be no need for a war to subdue ISIS because ISIS themselves are going to drop their guns in utter embarrassment and run to see what they can do to help the Jewish people, to help civilization get back on its feet. When God reveals himself to the world, like the way he did in the Egypt times, you know what the, the, the prophets have told us about the Messianic era? When we talk about the miracles of Egypt, we talk about these amazing miracles, and we tell over the story every year at the Passover Seder, we sit down, we tell over the amazing stories. The blood and the lice and the pestilence and the splitting of the sea. The sea literally just pulling back and the Jewish people walking through a marble-like floor. is amazing. After the Messiah comes, the, the miracles of the Messiah are going to be so great that no one's going to talk about the Egyptian exodus anymore. It's going to be small fry in comparison to the miracles that are going to happen at the time of the final Messiah. God will show himself so clearly to the world and there won't be a need ever again for a war because no one's going to want to fight. Everyone will see God clearly. If you see God clearly, you're not going against him. You're saying, wow, that's amazing. All I want to do is serve him. What role can I have in this world in serving God? If I'm not God's firstborn child, what can I do to help God's children? There are people today, by the way, there are people today who have that attitude. There are certain Christian groups even. The who new, have that attitude. The new uh, general, attorney, not attorney general, the new, um, the guy that's going to take over the UN. Uh, isn't it Haley who's taking over the UN? He's, Governor Haley, Nikki Haley, took over the UN? She's, 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 she's an ambassador, the one who's going to be the head of the... new the, secretary general? The secretary general is pro-Israel. Uh-huh, amazing. I'm so that happy to hear amazing. that. That is really amazing. Yeah, because the UN is the one place that's like the worst anti-Israel record in the world. Yeah, he's you know. made statements. Interesting. That wow. he's going to protect Israel. Wow. Okay. I'm excited so to see maybe that. it's the beginning. Maybe it's the beginning of the Messiah. Exactly. But the point is, when the Messianic era comes, that's that the world will be so filled with knowledge of God that there will no, no one will ever want to pick up an AK-47 again. Like it says. They will bleat, beat their swords into plowshares. People are going to take their AK-47s and melt it down and make it into agricultural equipment. You know, we talk about starvation in the world. There's enough food for everybody in the world. There's way more than enough. The world is, the earth is so amazingly prodigious. The earth could produce enough food to feed 14 billion people. The vast majority of places in the world where there's starvation, it's not because there's no food or no one willing to send them food from other parts of the world. It's because of access. It's because there's crazy wars there, and, and we can't get food over there. All these places in sub-Saharan Africa, where there's warlords and fighting, but there's more than enough food in the world. Imagine that day. Imagine the day when people, when ISIS takes its AK-47s and makes a big drop-in center, and everyone comes with their AK-47s and all their ammunition, they drop into this big smelting pot, and they start producing combines and plows and farming equipment. Beautiful, what a world. So we say to God now, we were in Syria, sorry, we were in Siberia, we were in Babylonia, and we, were, we still tried to rebel against God, and the very people we were talking to by rebelling against God turned on us and wanted to annihilate us, and we scream out, save us, save us, and God said, fine, I'll save you, but, but my name is nowhere on you. I'm, almost, I'm still embarrassed of you. My name is Noah on the Megillah. I don't want that. I'll save you because you're my son, but I'm not proud of you. You finally call out to me when you're being beaten in the square and I save you. All right, I'll save you, but don't put my name in the Megillah. 
Now we turn to God. We say, now that you saved us, now we realize you were there the whole time. We want to come back to the palace. We want to come back to that amazing open relationship with you. And God says, for that, you got to clean house first. You've got to clean your house up first. You need to go through your Rolodex. You need to get rid of all those things that were connecting you, all those friends that you had who were whispering into your ear, you could be the king. You've got to get rid of all the junk. And if you truly get rid of all the junk, then I will take you back to my palace. And I will once again declare to the world, this is my firstborn son, Israel. And I'll proudly display you as my son. But you've got some work to do. And that is the work that we do between Purim and Pesach. What's the job of the time between Purim and Pesach? Cleaning out the chametz. Next week, we're going to talk about the chametz. And we're going to try to understand from three different perspectives why the chametz is the devil. And why when we go on a witch hunt to clean out our houses for chametz, what we're saying is we want to get rid of all those forces that are keeping us from God so that God will be able to save us once again like he did in Egypt and bring even greater miracles and proudly once again say, this is my firstborn son, Israel. So next week, God willing, we'll come together for our final Wednesday in March and we'll discuss what does it mean when we remove the chametz from our houses and at the same time simultaneously from our hearts, what are we getting at? What's the real goal here? And how does that all work? Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day.